How many glad to be in the blessing season? It's your season to be blessed. Amen. To God be the glory. We give God honor and glory for today. If you will, turn with me, if you will, into your Bibles. Turn with me, if you will, in your Bibles to Deuteronomy, the 10th chapter. Deuteronomy chapter 10. And as I always tell you all, God always kind of gives us indicators that we are on track, that we're doing what God wants us to do. All throughout the service today, we, we learned how uh, certain things that were said, and I was saying, Lord, you're giving the witness of two. Amen to God be the glory. Deuteronomy chapter 10, if you find it, please stand with us as we want to start a new tradition. We want to give God reverence. We want to give his word reverence and uh, give his name glory as we find it. I ask that you please stand. And again, like I said, as, you, as you're looking for it, we're going to start a new sermon series, a new sermon series. And it's going to be the same title that it is today. What is required? What is required? Which will be our title for the day, but the sermon series is going to be called the same thing. Amen? Amen. Amen. Everyone has it? Amen. Let us look to the Lord and, and read and see what God has to say to us today. Beginning at verse 1, we'll read down to verse 10. It says, At the time the Lord said unto me, Hew thee two tablets of stone like unto the first, and come up unto me into the mount, and make thee an ark of wood. And I will write on the tablet the words that were in the first tablet, which thou breakest, and thou shalt put them in the ark. And I made an ark of shit and wood, and hewed two tablets of stone like unto the first. And when and went up unto the mountain, having the two tablets in hand. And he wrote on the tablets according to the first writing, the Ten Commandments which the Lord spake unto you the mouth out of, excuse me, spake unto you in the mouth out of the midst of the fire in the day of the assembly. And the Lord gave unto me. And I turned myself and came down from the mountain and put the tablets in the ark which I had made. And there they be as the tablet commanded me. Excuse me, the Lord commanded me. And the children of Israel took their journey from Beeroth to the of the children of Jehakan to Mosada, where Aaron died, and there he was buried, and Elijah his son ministered in, in the priest's office in the steed. And from thence they journeyed unto the Gadagajah, and from Gideo, Gideo Goda to Jordaba and land in the rivers of waters. At the time the Lord separated the tribe of Levi to bear the ark of the covenant of the Lord, to stand before the Lord to minister unto him, to bless his name until the day. Wherefore, Levi have no part nor inheritance which his brethren, the Lord is in the inheritance according as the Lord thy God promised him. And I stayed in the mount according to the first time, forty days and forty nights. And the Lord hearkened unto me at the time also, and the Lord would not destroy thee. You may have to take your seats. As we look at our text today, our subject again is going to be what is required. And as we begin to start this brand new sermon series, I want to do a little bit more teaching than preaching this here particular series. And next week we'll start at verse 11 and kind of go down from there. Um, but as we look to move forward, we need to know what is required of God. Before the children of Israel could move to the next phase to do the next thing that God had for them to do, they had to know that there were some requirements that needed to be met. And as we step along, as we set out on, on our journey, as we begin to go and do what God wants us to do, we must take in account this very 10th chapter, this 10th chapter to understand what God requires of thee. Now, brothers and sisters, I'm going to be honest with you. All week long, I begin to study just verse 11, 12, and 13. My whole aspect was just to do a sermon on verse 11, 12, and 13. 
But as I rose, as I do every Sunday morning before the daybreak, I get up very early in the morning. That's my little quiet time with God. I begin to write the sermon and begin to see what God wants us to go. And as I begin to try to go in and write verse 11, 12, and 13, God said, no, go back to verse 1 through 10. And I said, Lord, why are we going to go through 1 through 10? And God began to show me something. He says, the pieces are in place. Everything that you need to go on your journey, everything that you need to, in order to be successful, everything now is in place. And I began to look and say, Lord, what are you talking about? And God brought back to my memory, Reverend Pastor Rogers, Pastor Douglas, what's that last little missing piece that God was ready to put in to office. He was, it is the last little thing I have been praying for God to send us a, another minister to help along this journey, to help go in and bear the load, to do the thing that God wants us to do. And we begin to see, and God begin to show me today that Palmer Grove, I'm ready to move you to another level. I, I'm ready to take you to some new places, but I had to wait to everything was in place. And today, brothers and sisters, today I want to let you know that God has got everything in order. He's got everything that he wants to do, but he wants us to understand there's some requirements that have to be met. There's some things that we got to do. There's some things that he has got to put in place in order for us to go through and accomplish what God wants for us to accomplish. It says in the text that God tells him that his people would not be able to move forward. If you go down to that 11 verse, they, they had to arise and move forward. But before they could go and begin to move forward, they needed something from God. The very first few verses begin to show us. The very first thing they needed to have was order. They needed to have the rules and regulation, how to go in and do things the way God wanted things done. They needed those Ten Commandments. Why? Because those Ten Commandments was a covenant they made with God. They began to understand God said, I need you to have some things in order, in order for you to move forward and do what you got to do. So in that very first few verses, we understand that in order for us to move forward, we must have the word. We, we must have the word. Today, God gives them what they needed in order to go and move forward for him. See, see, brothers and sisters, in this same day, if we're going to go and get somewhere, if we're going to go and do some great things for God, if we're going to go in and succeed in this life, we got to have the word of God to guide our path. The Bible says that the word of God is a light unto our feet. He says it's a light unto your path. It's a light that brings you in some, when you get in some dark places, the word of God will lead you out of them. He said, you got to have the word of God. You got to have God's word. You need God's word to lead you. It is the word that came down from heaven that was clothed in flesh that made us see the way, the truth, and the life. It's the word of God that came down that needs to resonate in our hearts. It's the word of God that needs to be a light in your home. It's the word of God that needs to be a light on your job. It's the word of God that needs to lead us to where God wants us to go. And brothers and sisters, we can't get nowhere Without the word, if it does not guide us, we cannot get anywhere unless the word guide. The word shapes us. It molds us. It makes us become what we need to be. If we need a roadmap to success, it has to be the word of God. It has to predicate on the word of God. It's God breathed, God inspired, God divine, and God given. It's everything that we need in this day and time. If you don't have a steady dose of the word in your life, you malnutrition in this day and time. We need to get up and read the word. We need to take the word with us to our job. We need to sit down with the word. We need to eat on the word late in the evening. We need to go to bed with the word. We need the word of God. You need it. You need it. If you don't have the word, you don't have everything you need to be successful. It is the word that does everything we need to do. I'm going to say something that ain't too popular. 
to wrong. What's wrong with our churches today? The problem with our churches today is that we're not getting a steady dose yes, of the word. We coming in God's house trying to get in on the chain. We trying to come in God's house and feel good. But I come to tell you that we need the word more than anything else. We need to preach the word of God. Too many preachers are preaching about prosperity. Too many preachers are preaching about this, that, and the other. But God said, my word must go forth. And it does not come back to me void. We need the word of God to go out and primate and go into this here world to, to, to attack sin at its very core. We need to put the word on it. We talked today. We talked today in Sunday school about speaking a word. The centurion understood us and we said, Lord, all you got to do is speak a word and my servant will be healed. How many are ready to speak a word? You got to know a word in order to speak a word. You need the word in your life. I'm talking about to tell you, you need to have God's word in your life. We need the word in the church now more than ever. Amen. Mamas and daddies, do you speak a word over your children? Mamas and daddies, do you speak a word over your finances? Mamas and daddies, do you speak a word over your home? Do you speak a word over the situations going on in your life? Do you speak a word? We need God is showing them. And as you go on this journey, as you get to the place you need to give, you need the word. You got to stop trying to be entertained and you start getting equipped. Right. Let me say it again for you. We got to stop seeking entertainment. We got to stop seeking trying to feel good. We got to stop all that thing and say, Lord, I need you to equip me. So I can be able to do the work that you called me to do. See, many people can't do the work because they ain't equipped to do what God asked them to do. So they're trying to entertain you, trying to make you feel good. And I stopped by to tell you now today, brothers and sisters, you got to be equipped to do God's work. Right. Let me show you something with the bird, what the word said. It shows it right here in this here. And not by not getting feeling good. If you go down to, to, down to Hebrews 4 and 12, I want to show you something. See, the word doesn't entertain us. The word breaks us. You see, oh, so you missed me on that. The word does not entertain you. The word breaks you in order to build you back up. Yeah. Well, let me show you what I'm talking about. Let me, let me show you. The Hebrews 4 and 12 says, For the word of God is living and active. It's sharper than any double-edged sword. It pierces even to the dividing soul and spirit. The joint and marrow. It judges the thoughts and intentions of man. The word gets all the way down in you to break you down to build you back up. It, it, it does what it needs to do in this day and time. Yes, the word of God will break us, but it's shown up will build us. It's shown up will make us what we need to be. See, let me show you what I mean by building you up. 2 Timothy 3 and 15, verse 7 through 17 says, And from that, excuse me, and from a child thou hast known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Jesus Christ. He says that all scripture is given by inspiration of God. He said it is profitable for doctrine. It's profitable for reproof. It's profitable for correction. It's profitable for instruction and righteousness. That the man of God, watch this here, that the man of God may be perfect through furnishing through all good works. The word of God makes us perfect. When we begin to align our lives with the word, it begins to make us perfect. It makes us what we need to be. If you have a desire to be a soldier on the battlefield, you don't go out to war without your weapon. You need to have the word of God. You need to have the word deep down in your heart. If you own the battlefield, you want to have a weapon to shoot back at the enemy. He said the word, the word is like a sword. It's a sword, a double-edged sword. It'll cut both ways. It'll cut you as well as me. If, I'm, if I misuse the word, it'll cut me just as I'm trying to give it to you. He says, you got to have the word. God gives Moses the word. He said, ten commandments that were a covenant unto the people. I need my Bible readers. I need somebody who read the Bible. How to remember when they was up on, they came to the mountain and God met them on the mountain. The Bible said that God, when God came, God brought thunder and lightning. <laughs> he brought the, a red cloud. He brought his presence and he made it known to his people. And he began to give them the word. What happened to the people of Israel? Instead of receiving the word, they backed away from the word. 
Hear me on this here, brothers and sisters. If you want to accomplish everything that God has for you, you will not do it without the word. If you want to be successful on your job, you will not do it without the word. See, well, let, me, let me explain something to you. Yeah, you might get promoted. You may go through the ranks. But see, it's some about being saturated, covered in the word of God, that when things come up on your job, you know how to speak a word against it. You, you, you understand when, they, when somebody trying to stab you in your back, you can learn to let the word cover you. When somebody trying to pull you down, you can let the word cover you. We need the word. We need the word of God. And many times, brothers and sisters, I've learned in this day and time that many times we don't take the word with us. What good is a soldier like I told you on the battlefield if he don't have his weapon with him? We wonder why the devil is winning. We wonder why the devil is getting ahead because we're not using the word against him. What did Jesus use when the devil attacked him? When the devil tempted him, he used the word. We got to use the word in various situations. We got to learn to speak a word on this here situation. And today, brothers and sisters, I only got a couple of points. I only got two points. That's the first one. Next week, we'll get in, like I say, 11, 12, 13. But the second thing, he, he, as I began to look at that scripture this morning, and I began to say, okay, Lord, I, I, I got it. I got the word. I got it. I understand that, Lord. I got it. But God began to show us something else. I want to show you something. The text tells us that Aaron died. But I want to show you something. Aaron wasn't what God needed to get his people across the river. What am I trying to say to you? Watch this. Watch this. Now. Aaron let his people persuade him to do something that was against God's will. Yeah. 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 See, 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 see. God wants leadership that's going to only listen to him and not everybody else. See, 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 God needs leadership that's going to be aligned with him going in the direction he says go instead of sitting there being swayed by everybody else. He, he shows us something in the text. He said, Aaron died. Now his son has taken over. That means somebody else had to be in place to do the will of God. And not only that, that God also put some priest in place. I, I, I want to show you some because like I said, this will help me today when, when, when I was going through. It, it helped me so much when I began to leave, I mean, learn and understand what God was trying to say to me about Palmer Grove. He gave them praise to move forward. I, 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 want, I want you to hear me some. I, I got two pr preachers beside me right now. Two men of God that came in and is doing things in, in, in Palmer Grove. We got a man of God, a preacher that's doing another thing here. We got another man that came and aligned himself with him, but they still here. Do you see God has put things in order? God ready to move the church. He ready to take the church to a higher level. But first you got to get people in place. He said, I, I, I got to get Israel situated to understand in order for them to go forward, they got to have the right the people in the right spot. See, 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 in order to move forward, the man of God not only has to be able to teach and preach, but he also got to be a reflection of God. Let me show you something. I'm going to my, my Bible reason again. The qualification then to be a priest was you had to be from a certain tribe. You had to be a, a Levite. Yes, sir. You had to be a Levite in order to be a priest. But not only when you was from the right family, you had to have meet the right qualifications. What am I saying? They had to go through a process called consecration. You had to be set apart. You had to be different about some had to be different about you than the next man. They had to go through some. And see, in order for a man to be an image of God, he has to have the reflection of God inside of him. Come on, come on. Let me show you something here, brothers and sisters. Palmer Grove, this is what I want you to do for me. Because, see, I don't play with God. Nor do I play with God's word. Nor do I play with you when I stand before you. I try to stay my very best on the word of God. But I want to show you something. I just talked to you about being entertained. Be leery 
of the wolf that comes in sheep's clothing. Hit me on this here, Palmer Grove. Be leery of somebody who comes to the pulpit. They don't understand that you got to take this here job serious. You got to be careful who you align yourself with and who you let come in your ears. Because the wrong thought, thought get in your ear can cause you to do the wrong thing. It's, it's amazing. I, you know, I, again, yesterday I, I got invited again to, to that, 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 that men's prayer line that I was on last week that I told you about. And we was on there, and we had a preacher that came out and gave his exposition of a word. He gave, he gave a pastor the script, and he gave this whole big exposition, this, that, and the other. But the thing of it was, he had it all wrong. And everybody initially was, he put it hard, yeah, yeah, hoo, 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 yeah, 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 yeah. And I came on as politely as I could because it was eating me up that he had just told the word in the wrong way. And I said, as kindly as I possibly could, I said, the one thing that we have to be careful of is taking another man's word at his word. I said, turn with me to a particular verse that he had just spoke. I said, let's go through and let's read through that verse right there. X, Y, Z, A, B, C. I don't want to go in and, and, and embarrass him and, and, and go for it because he might be listening. But I want to go in and say this here, but I did say it. I said, you have to be careful of how you expose, do an exposition of God's word. Why do I say that? We're listening to a lot of things that have been traditionally said, but they're all wrong. He gave an exposition of something that he was trying to prove a point on, but he was all wrong in his exposition. And I explained as politely again as I possibly could. I said, we have to be careful how we handle the word of God. If you misuse it, you can lead people to destruction. You have to be careful how you handle the word of God. Because if you don't realize you have people's lives in your hands. And I stopped by to tell you now today, brothers and sisters, you got to realize one thing about me. I'm going to tell you, I'm going to do my very best. To stand on God's word. And if I don't, I'm going to tell you this here. If I don't and somebody come tell me and I realize I didn't stand on it right, I'm going to come back and tell you. Say, hey, I messed up right there. I, I, I didn't do it right right there. I, I messed it up. Let, 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 me tell, let me correct that. Because I understand it, the, the, the requirements that James said. Watch this right here. James said not everybody should be a teacher. Now see, now see, we, 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 we I'm going to me educate. We, we're teaching today. We're in a teaching sermon today. Amen. We're in a teaching sermon. He said, not everybody need to be a teacher. What James was saying right there, see, a lot of people don't realize, James was saying not everybody need to be a pastor. All right. All right. What, 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 what does the uh, Ephesians 4 verse 12? Well, let, let, let me show you how to go and break down word. If you turn with the Ephesians 4 and 12, if you don't have to do it, now do it in your spare time. I want you to understand how punctuation tells you something. Yeah. You go to that punctuation every time God gives an assignment. When Paul gives an assignment, a job description, he goes and he puts a semicolon behind it. He says, some are apostles, semicolon. He says, some are prophets, semicolon. He says, some are evangelists, semicolon. And he says, some are pastors and teachers. Yeah semicolon what am i trying to tell you is that and even in your qualifications he says every pastor must be able and have an app to teach if you can't teach then you are not qualified to be a pastor hear me now i don't feel good i told you i'm gonna feel good today i, I said that I, I i gave it i, I gave it the truth but what i'm trying to show you is that god is saying that these people have the, they needed to have a man of God. They needed a man of God to stand between them. Aaron was the high priest that gave us an example of how someone who's supposed to be holy that can stand between God. That's why I say Aaron went, went, went right. Aaron didn't meet all the qualifications. So after his assignment, after his death, God said, okay, we got, we got to, I, 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 I'm going to put somebody in the position, but it's only temporary to the main man can come to the position. Jesus Christ came to be the position 
in the position that God wanted him to be. He, watch this, right? Let me show you something. Aaron couldn't reflect the presence of God, but Moses could. Well, well, let me show you something. When Moses came down from the mountain, Moses was glowing. Why was Moses glowing? Because he was in the presence of God. See, it's some about a person who's filled with the Holy Spirit, get in the presence of God, there's something different about them. They're going to look different, they're going to act different, they're going to talk different, they're going to walk different. There's going to be some different things about somebody in the presence of God. Let me show you something. See, see, too many people come on Sunday trying to look like church. But on Monday through Saturday, they look like the world. <laughs> See, you can't be in the presence. The Bible said that the presence of God was all over Moses. You can't come in looking like, you can't come in just on Sunday morning and think you're going to be good and have everything you need Monday through Wednesday. It shows it right here. He said, you got to be in the presence of God. You needed some people who were light bearers to be in the presence of the people. Why? Let Let me explain something real quickly. The Bible tells us that many are called and few are chosen. He, he said, that the Bible was trying to show us something, that the word is going to go out and call many people to, to, the, to, 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 uh, to God, but only a few people are going to respond to, to it. Few people are chosen. Israel needed to see men working for God. They needed to see men serving God. They needed to see men sacrificing to God. They needed to see men that were consecrated and set apart for God. And I stopped by to ask you a question today, brother and sister. The world still needs the same thing. So where are the men at in the church today? Where are the men doing for God? Where are the men in this situation? Yes, we need men to be in the church. Our men working for God, serving God, sacrificing God, and sanctifying themselves for God. I stop by to ask you today, brothers and sisters, are we in position to do what God wants us to do? He said, are you in position? See, the church, I've learned something. Old preacher told me this. My mom always told me, she said, baby, she said, you're an old man trapping a young man's body. Even from a knee high to a duck, as my dad used to call it, I always loved to be around people that were older than me. I loved it. I loved to sit at their feet and just listen to them, listen to them talk. And this and then I heard an old preacher tell me this here. He said, a church cannot move forward, especially move forward with God, without men moving with it. Hear me here. I'm speaking to the problems of the church today. I'm not speaking just to Palmer Grove. I'm speaking to the problems of the church. Men have sat down on God. Right. Hear me. Look at the church. Women are doing the majority of the work in church. Women are sustaining the church. Women are doing a sacrifice in the church. And the men are comfortable sitting down. I'm telling you, <laughs> they, they, they got comfortable sitting down on God. And I stopped by to tell somebody that, that God does not want us sitting down. God did not call anybody to sit in the cut. He didn't call anybody to sit down. He, called, he told everybody to get up and go somewhere and tell somebody about the word of God. He, he calls us to move in this season. God is infinite in wisdom, and he understands that the people needed to see men devoted to him in order to stay connected to him. Watch this here, man. Let me show you something. Let me show you something. Now. A church is only as connected to God as their leadership. Your leader ain't connected to God. The church won't be connected to God. Hear me. Because the leader is God's mouthpiece. He is the one who stands before God for his people. He's the one who prays for you day and night. He is the one who calls down God and says, God's favor, please be on us. He is the one. So if he is not connected and you listening to him, then you ain't connected. 
I, again, I know this ain't going to be good because, like I said, it beat me up. I, I want everybody to know that God, God, God tackled me first. Because, like I said, I want to go somewhere else. And God said, uh-uh, you're going to hit them first ten verses. Them first ten verses are going to be preached in this sermon series so people know what I need. See, 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 let me show you something. The Bible says, as Deke said earlier, that faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. But it goes on to say, how can they hear without a preacher? How can they hear without a preacher? And how can he preach unless he be sent? I, I shared something with you all last week. When Pastor Rogers came in, Pastor Douglas, excuse me, when Pastor Douglas came in, most preachers, like I said, young preachers would probably have said, oh, Lord, oh, I got another pastor. He sees him. He this, he that, da, 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 da. Yeah, then the guy all probably got scared. You know what I told God? Thank you. Yes, I told him, thank you. Because I've been praying for, I've been praying for a minister. And I told you all last week. See, I understand that Palmer Grove was my assignment. How do I know that? I told you all, told especially those that are on the selection committee, I told you all after, after everything was said and done, all I kept telling y'all was I got something to tell you. All through the process, when we were doing Sunday school, I um, mean, not Sunday school, but Bible study, and, and after some of the sermons, I kept saying, I got something to tell you. Why did I say that? Because a year before y'all even thought about the process, I was on across that road. I was across that road coming to a funeral. And God told me beyond a shadow, it, it seemed like heaven opened up and said, this here is going to be your first assignment. All right. All right. So, 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 so when I know this here, see, I learned something about God's word. What God has for me is for me. It, it ain't for nobody else. In mine. So when we were going through the process, I had no doubt. All I told God, okay, Lord, if it ain't now, it'll be later. Because I, God had assured me that this was my first assignment. And I was good with that. I didn't care if it took 20 years from now. I would have been when God said the door is open, time for you to walk in, I would have walked in. I told my wife that. Did I lie, baby? I told her when I got back home, I said, baby, I know my assignment. I know where I'm supposed to go. And I'm not going to give up on it until God said let go of it. The, the, the thing that I, I want you to see here. Is that again, I want you to understand why it's so important. I, I, I want you all to, to look at it. I want you to go back home and look at this here, why it's so important that, it, that, that, that we have to hear the gospel, that you need men of God to speak the gospel. In Ephesians chapter 5, I want to show you something. Ephesians chapter 5, verses 9 through 10. Now, I want you to understand that when you first get to the book of Isaiah, excuse me, not Ephesians, excuse me, I'm sorry, Isaiah. In the book of Isaiah, the very first thing, and God came to Isaiah, and God said to Isaiah, here I am, send me, Lord. Hey, he didn't say, I mean, not in those words, but uh, Isaiah was ready to go in and do God's work. I, I want to show you oh, why it's so important. See, it, it, in order to save people, there needs to be a preachment of God's word. In the, Isaiah chapter 5, verse 9, look, look, look what it said. Uh, Isaiah, again, he, he wanted to go and do the assignment, but he, he didn't realize the, 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 uh, sit, uh, all the stuff that's going to go with the assignment. It, it, it reads, it says, he said, go and tell these people, keep on hearing, but don't understand. Watch out there now. That, oh, he says, keep on seeing, but don't perceive. He says, make the heart of these people dull, that their ears heavy and, their sh and shut their eyes. Least they see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and return and be healed. Now, now what, what, I want to show you something. This is God speaking to Isaiah. And in Isaiah, he's telling him, you preach the word, but, but, but when you preach the word, they, they, they ain't going to hear it. He said, when, they, when, you, when you show them the word, they ain't going to see it. He said, their hearts are going to be so dull, their eyes are going to be so heavy, that, that their ears are going to be shut up. He said, they're not going to really receive what's going on. What in the point was God trying to tell the man of God to keep on doing this Why, when people ain't going to hear? See, 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 watch this here. It hurts. A man of God to stand 
and preach your word when nobody want to hear it. It hurts a man of God for someone to stand and no one want to hear it. Let me take this. Let me take it one more. Let me take it one more level. It hurts God for him to send a prophet to proclaim his word and a nation don't want to hear it. They rather go through destruction than to go in and be with God. <laughs> Man here is trying to lean to their own understanding. And God is saying, I need you to trust me and my word. And when my word tell you to move, move. Isaiah asked the Lord, how long? For how long shall I preach to them and they won't listen? But watch what God's answer to God says, until the cities are laid waste without inhabitant and the houses without a man and a land is utterly destroyed. Why does God allow things to go on and happen when we don't listen? Why? Because when we get in a situation, it's all about then you remember what God told you. I told you, it's sometime God got to lay you flat on your back. He got to lay you flat on your back so you can look up at God. Then you remember what God done brought you from. You remember what God has done for you. You remember what was said in the church. Then you want the word. God said, I take everything from you to make you want my word. I take everything you got to make you want my word. Do you want my word? I stopped by to tell you, you need a man of God to come before you and proclaim the word. You need somebody to proclaim the word. Basically, man will not listen until we are destroyed. And God is saying, I need you to come back in. God gave him priests. He gave him priests to do the work. He gave him priests to deal with sin. He gave him priests to do something. Why? Because Jephro began to, God used Jephro to teach Moses something. God said, you can't do it all by yourself. I praise God for a leadership team. I praise God that he sent another man of God here to us. I praise God for that because why? I, I, I might want to be Michael Jordan, but I can't win the title by myself. I need them. I need you. And we need God. We need, we need each other, like I said, and we need God. We need to be aligned with God to do what God wants us to do. God gave us a light holder. He gave us preachers to teach his word, to preach his word, and to reflect his glory. He gave us that. He, he gave us that to tell men, women, and children of God to lead from the front and not from behind. When you look in the battle back in the old days, the king was always out front. He never was behind. Even when David came up to fight Goliath, he led from the front because he was the anointed king because Saul had lost his glory. He came from the front. And brothers and sisters, I began to get ready to go to my clothes. As I began to get ready to sit down, I want to tell you again that God does not call you to sit down in the pews. We all got an assignment. We all are royal priests. We all are, are called to do the work of God. We all are, 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 are supposed to be in the game. And it's game time. Anybody who's been in the game understands sitting on the bench don't always feel good. But one thing I've learned about sitting on the bench because I, I didn't always start. But the one thing I learned about sitting on the bench, I got to always be ready. Because I never know when God may call me to the game. And if I ain't ready to go into the game, I go in there and I'll mess up and God, I mean, and, and the coach will pull me right out. So I've learned to always be prepared to go into the game because sometimes God said, you got to be ready to play. You got to be ready to do. And God is looking for a few good men. A few good women, a few good children, a few good servants, a few good uh, greeters, a few good choir members, a few good deacons, a few good missionaries, a few good this, that, and the other. He's looking for some good men and women to do his work. Christ chose 12 men to train so they can go and save the world. And as I hurry to the close, I want to ask you a question. Are you ready for the assignment, Palmer Grove? 
Ladies, are you ready for the work? Men, are you ready for the work? And as I begin to get ready to go to the close, I want you, if you're ready for the work, I want you to say yeah. If you're ready for God to do something in your life, say yeah. If you're ready to get in and get ready for God to move in your life, say yeah. I stopped by to tell you now that God came down in his unchanging hand and said, I'm ready to set the world free. I'm ready to do something for the world. And Jesus came down. Twelve generations to do what was required. Stayed here 33 long years to teach the word to do what was required. He carried a rugged cross all the way up Galgotha Hill to do what was required. He endured hardship, pain, agony, and suffering on the cross to do what was required. And brothers and sisters, I try to tell you, the Bible says he died on that cross. Did not he die? He died to do what was required. He stayed in the grave three long days. The Bible says, but on that third day, the Bible says he rose up early that Sunday morning. I don't know about you today, brothers and sisters, but I'm glad he rose early that Sunday morning. I'm glad he got up because he got up to do what was required. He got up out of that grave because all power was in his hands. He got up to do what was required. I don't know about you today, but I came down to serve the Lord. I came to do what is required. I don't know about you today, but I'm glad he got all power in his hands. I'm glad it's not some power, but he got all power, all power in heaven and in earth. He got all power in his hands, all power Lord, to move heaven and earth, all power to do what God requires for him to do how power to move the church I don't know about you but ain't you glad that God got all power ain't you glad that God can move some mountains ain't you glad that God can make a way out of no way ain't you glad ain't you glad that God can do what he required for him to do he got with all power he was ready to to do what is required, ready to do the will of God, ready Lord, to put his hands in God's hands. I stopped by to ask somebody today, are you ready to put your hands in God's hands? Are you ready to praise ye the Lord? Are you ready to pray to our Father? Are you ready? Are you ready to do what we is required. Do you know my Jesus? I'm so glad I know who Jesus is. I'm so glad I learned him in the pardon of my sins. How many know him? Ain't he all right? Ain't he all right? Ain't he all right? Ain't he all right? I know, oh Lord, my God is all right. We got to be ready to do what is required. 